Hello, in this video we're just going to go through your Year 10 uh, IGCSE mock, uh, trying to give you some answers to the common questions that you might have. We're starting off with the multiple choice, check out our other video for the structured. Okay, so the first question asks you to resolve two forces. We have a three newton force acting upwards and a four newton force acting to the right. So one of the things you will probably want to try to remember uh, when it comes to uh, drawing forces is the idea that we like to top to tail uh, vectors. Uh, so what that means is to work out what the resultant force is, is we're going to do one of these forces first, in this case the 4 Newton, and then immediately after, that's when we're going to do the 3 Newton. Um, and the resultant force then acts that way. That's our resultant force. I can try it the other way around. Um, if I do the uh, 3 Newton force first, and then I do the 4 Newton force, uh, you can see that again, my resultant force ends up over there. So the answer to that question is A. Question 2. Before marking the finishing line or running track, a ground zone measures out its 100 metre length. So you're looking for 100 metres, so you want something that is quite long. So it certainly can't be a 30 centimetre ruler or a micrometer, because you're dealing with large distances. So it's between a metre ruler and a measuring tape. Um, now, a metre ruler is only one metre, so what you have to do is have a metre, then lay it out on its end, and another metre, and that's going to take you ages. So the correct answer is a measuring tape. And it's probably worth you learning that um, in general, that when we're dealing with distances of greater than a metre, usually a measuring tape is the right thing to use. Um, sometimes you see the sound question where it says, how would you measure the speed of sound? Um, and you normally do that by doing an echo um, and measuring how long it takes sound to get back to you. Again, you'd use a, meet, uh, sorry, a measuring tape for that. Question three. The high-speed graph for a falling skydiver is shown below. As he falls, the skydiver spreads out his arms and legs and then opens his parachute. Which one shows terminal velocity? So if you remember, at terminal velocity, uh, the forces are balanced. So the forces on our skydiver, if this is our skydiver, uh, the forces on them are his weight acting downwards, which is mass times gravity. And we've got air resistance acting upwards. Um, so at terminal velocity, the weight is equal to the air resistance. So the resultant force is zero. Because uh, F is equal to mass times acceleration, if F is zero, math, uh, sorry, acceleration must be zero, which means that velocity must be constant. So... This is a speed time graph, so I'm looking for a period with constant speed, so it's got to be D over there. Okay, question four. So a car of mass 15,000, sorry, 1,500 kilograms travels along a horizontal road. It accelerates steady, steadily from 10 meters per second to 25 meters per second in five seconds. What is the force needed to produce this acceleration? Okay, so um, a good way to start here is to think about what uh, you have been given uh, in terms of your uh, numbers. Um, and if you're not sure which equations to use, um, now is a really good time uh, just to highlight what we have. So I have a mass of 1500 kilograms, so that's M. Um, I have a initial velocity uh, which we we'll always call U, and a final velocity, which we always call V, and I've got a time. So the first thing you should remember is that acceleration is equal to the change in speed, so that's V minus U, divided by the time taken. So in this case, it will be 25 take away 10 divided by 5, so that's 15 divided by 5, so the acceleration is 3 meters per second squared. So now I've got some acceleration, um, and using the acceleration and the force, I can use the fact that, sorry, acceleration and the mass, I can say that force is equal to mass times acceleration. So therefore, uh, the force is equal to 1,500 times 3, uh, which is 
4,500 newtons. So the answer is C. For question five, it says balanced forces are acting on a moving body. What happened to the direction of movement and the speed of the body? Um, so the forces are balanced. If the forces are balanced, um, then that means that the object is not accelerating. Because acceleration is rate of change of velocity, not speed, uh, and velocity has a direction, I can say that because it's not accelerating, uh, uh, the movement does not change. So it cannot be A or B because it can't be the direction changes. And I also know that if the forces are balanced, the speed can't be changing. Um, so it, oops, sorry, so it can't be uh, D. Sorry, so it can't be C. So the answer must be D. <coughs> Question six: Particle P is moving in a horizontal circle about O. P moves at a constant speed. So this is a circular motion question. Um, and you should remember that when something is travelling in circular motion, the speed, which is the distance it's covering per second, doesn't change. Um, but velocity will change. Go away. Um, so... The reason that happens is because when we're travelling with, with circular motion, there's always a force towards the centre. Um, that force must be uh, constant. Uh, so the answer is B. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, the answer is B. Um, the force does not act in the direction of motion, so it's not A. Um, the force shouldn't uh, change as it goes around the circle. We deal with some that do change at A level, but for now we don't need to worry about that. Um, and there definitely is a resultant force, because if there wasn't a resultant force, this direction couldn't be changing. Uh, question seven. Uh, this is a question all about efficiency. Um, so for any uh, object, we always know that the total energy input is equal to the useful energy output plus the wasted energy. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, energy is always conserved, so we can never have uh, more energy coming out than coming in. Um, just looking at the answers they've given us here. Um, oh, okay, yeah, because it says it's 50% efficient, um, so that means that useful output energy must be equal to wasted energy, so the answer is D. Uh, which characteristics formed, uh, describe an image formed by a vertical plane mirror? Um, so in a mirror, uh, we have a virtual image, and it's not inverted. So if you remember, if this is my mirror, uh, and here is my object, in a mirror, you will see uh, the same thing um, on the other side. Uh, so it will look like that. Um, it's not inverted because when you look at yourself in a mirror, you don't see yourself upside down. Uh, question nine, what is the focal length of the lens? Uh, so it's probably pretty tempting to say that it's here because we know that uh, when you see a lens with that typical um, three lines together where they cross is the focal point. However, that only works if these beams coming in are all parallel to each other, um, which isn't the case here. So don't be tempted to think that the focal point is occurring here. Where is the focal point coming? Well, if you look at this beam here, if you remember the basic rules of drawing a, a ray diagram, you always draw one line that I'm going to highlight now in red that goes straight through the centre of the lens. You then draw one top line that goes in parallel to the principal axis, and then it bends down. And how do you know where it bends down? It goes down through the focal point. So actually the focal point is there, so the answer must be B. 
Uh, question 10, what is the possible frequency of an ultrasound wave? So for this one, you need to know that human hearing ranges from 50 hertz, some people say 20 hertz, to 20,000 hertz. So ultrasound is anything higher than what humans can hear. Anyone higher than 20,000 is D. Question 11. A wave has a frequency of 2 hertz. How many waves are produced in one minute? So what you need to remember is hertz means the number of waves per second. So we're getting 2 waves per second. Um, so that means that in 60 seconds, I will get 2 times 60, or 120 waves. Question 12. Uh, the diagram shows a speed time graph for the motion of a car in 4 seconds. What is the distance travelled in 4 seconds? So what you need to remember is that the area under the graph, or under a speed time graph, or a velocity time graph, um, is the distance travelled. So for this shape, I'm going to split it into two. I'm going to call this shape A and this shape B. So for shape A, um, it will be 10 times 1 because it's a square. So that will be 10 metres. And then for shape B, this is a triangle. Uh, with a base of 3, not 4, because it starts over here. Uh, so it will be 3 times 10 divided by 2, so that will be 15. So my total distance will be 10 plus 15, so it will be 25 metres. The answer is B. Question 13. Which pair of quantities includes one scalar and one vector. So mass is a scalar, it has no direction. Time is also a scalar, we don't have a direction of time. Temperature is a scalar, uh, time is a scalar. Temperature is a scalar. Velocity is a vector, so my answer is going to be C, but just for completeness, uh, velocity is a vector, and weight's a, sorry, weight's also a vector, because weight, remember, is the force due to gravity, and the force always acts down towards the centre of the Earth. Question 14. A uh, speed time graph represents the journey of a car. The dots separate different sections of the journey. There are six sections. So this would be section 1, this would be 2, this would be 3, 4, 5, and 6. How many sections represent the car moving with non-uniform acceleration. So uniform means constant in this case. So it's basically asking you how many times does the car move with non-constant acceleration. Um, non-constant acceleration is represented by a curve, so that would be this section and this section. So there are two of those, so the answer to question 14 is C. Okay. Hi, Eden. Uh, I'm going to walk you through questions 15 to 27. So, question 15 says, a steel ball is released just below the surface of thick oil in a cylinder. During the first few centimetres of travel, what is the acceleration of the ball? Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is say, okay, well, acceleration is equal to the resultant force on the steel ball divided by its mass, and its mass is obviously constant. So initially, when the ball begins to fall, you have the force, the resultant force, uh, being the weight. So initially, F equals W, uh, before any drag forces have started to occur, because it starts from rest. Um, at this point, if F is the weight, which acts down, the acceleration will be maximum. Uh, I'm going to draw over on this side the steel ball. So initially I have W acting down. Um, as the ball then is accelerating because of its weight, 
it's going to be moving through more oil particles per second and the drag against it will increase. So at that point, I will have a force, oh sorry, very dodgy arrow there, a drag force acting up and that value of that drag force is going to increase because the ball is speeding up. That then means that the resultant force, R, at any point is going to be downwards, but it's going to be equal to the weight minus the drag. If it's the weight minus the drag, that value is therefore going to go down as drag increases. And if the resultant force is going down, if we go back to our original acceleration equation, the acceleration must also be going down. And so the answer is C, decreasing. So we're going to move on to question 16. Uh, this one actually I think is one of the most complicated questions on the paper. Uh, but once you get your head around it, it's fine. So we've got a hard stone hits the ground and comes to rest almost immediately. As the stone hits the ground, what is the direction and the size of the force acting on the ground? So we've got two things to consider here. Now I'm going just to take um, the initial idea of a stone resting on the ground. And at that point, the force down is obviously W. That should come from the centre of the stone. The weight, uh, mg. Now, in the question, however, we have the stone falling, and if the stone is falling, it has momentum. So in the case that we have, what we actually have is a stone falling down, and it's going to hit the ground, but initially it has momentum, mass times velocity. Now, when you learned about momentum, you learned about something called impulse, and we had the force multiplied by the time is equal to the change in momentum. What I can say is Ft is equal to mv minus mu. You can see that if I rearrange this equation, I get F is equal to mv minus mu all over t. And I can express that by saying that the force is equal to the rate of change of momentum. That's important because what we therefore know is that if the stone has momentum and then it collides with the ground and it comes to rest, it has changed momentum over time. And so therefore there is a force because the momentum of the stone is changing. So in addition to the weight that would just act if you had the stone at rest, you also have an additional force because of its momentum that it has initially. Uh, so you actually have a force value that is larger than the weight at the point where the stone is falling and hits the ground until it comes to rest. Once it's come to rest, then the force is the weight, but at the point where it is slowing and it is in contact, you actually have a force that is larger than the initial value, and obviously it acts downwards. So you've got your answer for this one being B. Moving on to question number 17 now. So a car of mass 1500 kilograms is towing a trailer of mass 1100 kilograms along a level road. The acceleration of the car is 1.3 meters per second squared. Ignoring friction and air resistance, what is the driving force on the car? So we can sketch this out. This a bit here. And I've got a car towing a trailer. And I have the whole thing accelerating at 1.3. I know that the car has this value. And, oh, wrong way around, but you get the idea. Wrong way around, but that doesn't matter. Total mass is the same. Uh, so I'm going to use F equals MA. Now, in this case, the driving force of the car is having to pull both the car and the trailer. So it's really important that we add the two masses together to find the total mass of the total system being influenced by the force. So my total mass is going to be equal to 1500 plus 1100. This could be where people trip up. So that gets us 2600. 
and then I'm just going to plug that into f equals ma and I'm going to have 2600 multiplied by 1.3 which is given in the question and that gives me my answer straight away. It gives me 3380 newtons, which makes the answer D. So quite a straightforward one there. Just don't forget that the total mass is important. So a beam is pivoted at one end. So you can see the pivot on the left. And there's a 5 newton force acting vertically upwards at 2 centimetres from the pivot. Uh, and then the weight of the beam acts at 5 centimetres from the pivot because you add the two and the three. The key here is that it tells you in the question that the beam is in equilibrium. So what that means is we have the sum of our clockwise moments being equal to the sum of our anti-clockwise moments if it is indeed in equilibrium. So we can look at clockwise, we can look at anti-clockwise and we can work out our weight of our beam. So our total clockwise moment is going to be equal to the weight multiplied by the perpendicular distance of the weight from the pivot which is going to be 2 plus 3 which is going to be equal to 5w total where w is weight then our anti-clockwise moment comes from our vertical upwards force of 5 and that is acting at a distance of 2 I don't think you need a calculator for that so I have uh, 10 newtons per centimetre anti-clockwise and I know that that is equal to my clockwise moment which is 5w so this is quite straightforward so 10 over 5 gives me 2 and that is w so therefore the weight of my beam is 2 newtons so that's quite straightforward so we'll move on to question number 19 this is a bit of a recall question. So four uh, objects of equal mass rest on a table. The center of mass of each object is labeled at G. Now the center of mass is where we assume all of the mass to be acting from, even though in reality it is evenly distributed throughout the object. The question asks which object is the least stable. It could be a really easy thing to miss the word least if you're not reading carefully. Uh, so we need to think about our conditions for stability. So, conditions that we have. We know that the most stable object will have the centre of mass uh, acting as close to the base as possible. And we also know that the base will be as wide as possible, so it will have the larger surface area. So, taking a look at A, B, C and D, the centre of mass is acting at G, so we're just going to track lines down to see how far above the base the centre of mass is acting, and you can easily see that B's centre of mass is the highest, and you can also look at the base width, and you can see that B has the smallest base as well. So therefore, that is going to be the least stable. <clears throat> okay, that was quite a straightforward one. The next one, however, is a bit trickier, and I imagine it will have caught a lot of people out. So, a 100 gram mass uh, is suspended from the spring next to a vertical meter ruler. The top of the spring is level with the zero centimeter mark, and the bottom of the spring is level with the 27.2 centimetre mark. A 100 gram mass is then replaced with a 600 gram mass, and the length of the spring is now 89.7 centimetres, and the spring has not reached the limit of proportionality. So that means throughout the whole question, we can use our equation F is equal to Kx, where F is the force, K is the spring constant, and X is our extension. So it tells us that the 600 gram mass is replaced with a 200 gram mass and asks us to find what the original length of the spring is. Now the trouble with this question is, since we don't know the length of the spring with no load, we have to take the length that we have at 100 grams as our initial point. So when we have 100 grams, we know that it is 27.2 centimetres long. Then, when six, uh, 
500, sorry, grams is hung. We've only added 500 grams from our initial point. Okay, the difference between 100 grams and 600 is obviously 500. 500 grams is five newtons. So 500 grams is 0 0.5 kilograms. I'm gonna multiply that by 10 for the value of G and I get five newtons. So, I know that at this point, the length of the spring is, if I look at the question, 89.7 centimeters long. So from 100 grams to 600 grams, where I have added 500, or I have added a force of five newtons, the extension is going to be 89.7 minus 27.2 so I'm going to get 62.5 centimeters of extension for having added 5 newtons that then allows me to find my spring constant so I'm going to use F oh my goodness me sorry let's go back and back and get rid of some of these lines Come on. F is equal to KX I know, sorry, bad use of technology there. And I know that when I added five newtons, 500 grams to go from 100 to 600, my extension was 62.5. Okay, and that's going to be equal to, uh, if I multiply that by my spring constant, sorry, I will get five. So five is kx, k we don't know, x is the extension was 62.5. That allows me to work out that K is 0 0.08 newtons per centimetre. Okay, I didn't bother changing things into metres, but that's okay. So now I know that when I add 200 grams, I'm actually only adding 100 grams more than I initially had. So I'm actually adding 100 grams more than my initial point that I know of. So that would be, oh my goodness me, that would be one newton. So I can then use my equation again, um, F equals KX, and I can say that X is equal to F over K. And when I've added one newton or 100 grams, my spring constant is still 0 0.08, I will get an extension of 12.5 centimetres when I've added my 200 grams from my initial 100. But that's not my final answer because I knew that when I had 100 grams already there, it was at 27.2. So I'm now going to say, well, I had 27.2 centimeters and it would be extended by 12.5, which is going to get me to my 39.7. Oh, sorry about that decimal point. And that takes me to answer C. So I think that's, that's got a lot of working for one mark, um, and that, that's one of the hardest questions on the paper. Luckily, the next ones are a bit easier. So, number 21. A block of metal is taken from the earth to the moon. And it asks which property of the block changes. So, if you're unsure about how to do questions like this, if you've just completely forgotten, think about equations, think about what you know. So you know that weight is equal to mg, and you know that density is equal to mass over volume. Our options are density, mass, volume, and weight. It should hopefully be pretty obvious to you which one changes, but just in case, mass is the amount of stuff that you have in the object measured in kilograms. Um, so that's fixed, that's not going to change. It doesn't matter where you are, you have the same amount of stuff in you, and hopefully you haven't been compressed and your volume is still the same. So that's also fixed. So it's not that one, and it's not that one that changes. So if mass and volume don't change, density is mass divided by volume, it also won't change. It should be pretty obvious to you that the weight does change because it is a product of your mass and the acceleration due to gravity. And on the moon, the acceleration due to gravity is different, so your weight would be different. So hopefully a much quicker one after the spring. So number 22. A ball is held at rest on one side of a curved track. You've got a starting point and a stopping point. The ball is released. It rolls down one side of the track and part of the way up the other side. It then stops before rolling back down again. The height of the stopping point is less than that of the starting point. 
what is the sequence of energy changes between starting and stopping for the first time? Okay, <clears throat> so we know that initially the ball is at rest, but it's at a height. And we know GPE is equal to MGH, so it has some gravitational potential energy. As it starts to roll down the side of the track, its height above the rest position decreases, and so its GPE must decrease. Okay, so we know that potential energy is being converted to something else. Obviously, as it starts to roll down the slope, it will also speed up, and KE is a half mv squared. Uh, if the velocity is getting higher, so is the kinetic energy. That should be fairly obvious to you. And then once it's reached its lowest point and it's at its fastest point and then starts to move up back up the other side of the track, uh, you know that that kinetic energy will be converted to gravitational potential energy again. Now, if there are no energy losses to the surroundings, there will just be a change from gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. But that would mean then that your total GPE would be the same at the highest points, which would also mean that H is the same. Now, it tells us that the height of the stopping point is less, so therefore, there must have been some energy losses to the surroundings. So heat must come into play. So we can immediately get rid of A, because there's no heat as an option. So then we need to have a little look, and you can see that in B and C, what is being suggested is that you've got potential energy being converted either to kinetic energy or heat and then that kinetic energy or heat being converted to either heat or kinetic, kinetic energy. Sorry, that was a mouthful. You, you aren't going to have that. You don't have the, the gravitational potential energy suddenly being converted to heat, which is then suddenly converted to kinetic energy. At the same time, gravitational potential energy is going to be converted to both kinetic energy and heat. You're not going to have them as a multiple step. It's happening simultaneously. So we need to look for the one that has the plus sign because you're getting an instantaneous change. I think that one should be fairly straightforward for you all. Okay, number 23. The speed of radio waves is C. A radio station transmits waves with a wavelength lambda. What is the frequency of transmission? Now this is really just a case of remembering your equation. Um, so you know that in waves, V equals F lambda, where V is the velocity or the speed of the wave. F is the frequency and lambda is the wavelength. And if I rearrange to find F, I get V over lambda. And it tells you in the question that the speed of the radio waves is C, so V equals C. So therefore, that's A equal to F. F must equal C over lambda. Now, to units always help you with equations if you can't remember which way around they go. You know that frequency is an amount per second. You know that a speed is in meters per second and you know that a wavelength is in meters. You can see that those meters will cancel on the top and the bottom of the fraction, and you're left with per second, and you know that a frequency is per second. So that's your best way of checking that the equation uh, is the right one, but hopefully you have remembered. Number 24. Light is incident on one face of a glass block at an angle of incidence of 40 degrees. Now my suggestion to you is that you always draw a diagram. So I've got a glass block, and the glass block is in air. So here I have air, here I have glass. I know it's important that they've told me that because I know that the refractive index of one, draw an arrow instead of an equal sign, um, for air, n is one. That is key. They need you to know that in the question. Uh, the refractive index of the glass is 1.46 and it asks you what is the angle of refraction inside the block. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw my normal line where my incident ray hits the glass block and it tells me that light is incident at an angle of 40 degrees. Um, you know that it's moving into a more dense and slower material so it's going to move towards the normal and we're trying to find the value of r here 
So I have my equation n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2. Now initially I'm in air, so n1 is 1, and I have sine 40. And I'm moving into glass, which I'm told has a refractive index of 1.46. And sine theta 2 is my refracted ray, so that's the angle I'm trying to find. Uh, so all I'm going to do is say that sine theta 2 equals sine r, which is what I'm looking for. And that is equal to sine 40 over 1.46. I'm just going to plug that into the calculator and that will get me to r being 26.12 degrees. Now, if I then look, all my answers are to two significant figures, which means that I'm going to choose A, which will be 26, which should be fairly straightforward to you. Number 25, almost there for my, my section of the questions. Light is incident on a mirror and is reflected as shown. And it asks you, what is the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection? So the first thing you need to do really is label where they are. The arrow tells you the direction of the light rays that's coming from... Oh, I don't want to do that, sorry. It is going... Oh my goodness me, I don't like writing on a screen. Okay, my angle of incidence is here. And my angle of reflection is here. That should be fairly obvious to you. Um, you should also be able to see that you're told that this is 80 degrees. 80 over 2 is obviously 40 degrees, which tells me that this is 40. And you know that a normal acts at 90 degrees to the surface, so that's a right angle. 90 minus 40 is 50, and therefore that is equal to R. And you also know um, that you have the law of reflection is angle of instance is equal to the angle of reflection. So therefore that is also equal to I. I have a little look and I can see that the answer is D. Okay, 26 is more about thinking than doing calculations. Below are four statements about the uses of electromagnetic radiation. Gamma rays are used in medical treatment. Infrared waves are used in sunbeds. Microwaves are used in satellite television and X-rays are used in intruder alarms. How many of these statements are correct? So, hopefully when you were learning about the electromagnetic spectrum, you were learning about their uses and you know that gamma rays are used in medical treatment. They're used to uh, sterilize medical, medical equipment, but they can also be used um, in scanning to take images of your body. They're also used in some cancer treatments too. Infrared waves are used in sunbeds. Hopefully you know that that's incorrect. It's the UV part of the spectrum that are used in sunbeds. Microwaves are used in satellite television. Um, so microwave communication is used between us at Earth and satellites in orbit. And X-rays are used in intruder alarms doesn't really make much sense. It's much more likely to be visible light. Um, so hopefully you can see that two of those are therefore correct. That's really just a memory game. So you're told the uses on uh, the CIE syllabus. You have to know those and then you're expected to remember them. Okay, number 27. This is my last question for you. Uh, and it's really year nine knowledge. So it's really... Um, one that you may have got wrong if you have forgotten stuff from me and I you didn't, didn't think about um, charging and static electricity too much uh, while you're revising. So, a polythene rod is rubbed with a duster. The duster then attracts small pieces of paper. Are the rod and the duster charged or uncharged? So, I'm going to draw... Once I get rid of my lines, I'm going to draw my duster and my polythene rod. Now, initially, before I rub them, I'm going to have an equal distribution of positive and negative. So I've got neutral objects. Um, think logically, things around you aren't shocking you all the time. So normally things are neutral. 
Uh, when I then rub the rod with the duster, I have some friction, and so the duster um, and the rod are interacting with each other. Friction means that electrons are able to move. It's polythene, so that means that the electrons are going to move from the duster to the rod. So this one, this one, and this one will all move over here. And what I'll be left with is a net positive charge on my duster and a net negative charge on my rod because I suddenly have more electrons than I do protons on the rod and I suddenly have less electrons than I do protons on my duster. That therefore means that they are both charged and the answer is A. Remember that it's only electrons that can move um, so it's negative that move rather than positive. Your protons are stuck in your nucleus or your atoms. Uh, so those are my questions. Okay, so we're going to look at question uh, 28 now. So in question 28, we've got a cyclist travelling on a hilly road. There's no air resistance and no air and no friction. It says they are negligible here. Okay, so we're shown a speed time graph. And what we need to think about here is, um, at what point has he reached the bottom of the first hill? So, when he's going down a hill, his speed will be increasing. When he's going up a hill, he'll be slowing down. And when he's on flat ground, because there's no air resistance and no friction, he'll travel at a constant speed. So we can see at A, he is travelling at a constant speed, so he must be on flat ground. Between A and B, he is speeding up, so he must be in that section going down a hill. Then between at B, he's travelling at a constant speed, and from B to C, he is slowing down, so he must be going back up a hill. So that definitely tells us here it must be B, because he's sped up, he's going down a hill, and then he's slowed down because he's reached the bottom of that hill and started going up a new one. Okay. Question number 29. Okay, the key bit here is a student drops a table tennis ball in air. And the key bit in air means there will be air resistance as well. Okay, so we know when we drop a tennis ball, first of all, there's one force acting on it, which is its weight. Okay, and then that means its velocity is going to increase because it's going to speed up because of that force accelerating it. So I know first of all it must be either C or D because the velocity is increasing. The next thing then is what's going to happen to the acceleration. Well as it speeds up air resistance is going to start acting on it here in the opposite direction. Okay, that air resistance is going to reduce the resultant force, so that means there will be less force pulling our um, ball down in total. So his acceleration will actually decrease, so the answer here is C. Question number 30 is very similar to question number 29. Okay, so there's two forces acting on our coin. As it falls, we've got Q, which is its weight, and we've got P, which is air resistance. Okay, so um, what happens to force P and the resultant force? Okay, so because P and Q are in opposite directions, the resultant force on our coin is going to be equal to Q minus P. Okay, Q is acting down, P is acting up. So at the start, when you first drop a coin, there's just its weight. As it gets faster, air resistance gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Okay, so as it's falling, it's going to be getting faster. Okay, so that means its air resistance must be increasing. So if air resistance is increasing, we know force P is increasing, so it must be C or D. If force P is getting larger, okay, and it's in the opposite direction to Q, that means the resultant force will be getting smaller or decreasing. So this one, number 30, must be C. 
number 31. Okay, so number 31 is us going back to the centripetal force. So we know for someone going in a circle or going around a corner, in order for that to happen, there must be a force acting towards the center of the circle. Okay, so it won't be going up or down, it must be acting towards the center. Okay, if he's uh, leaning into a corner, you know as a motorcyclist leans into a corner, that's the direction they will turn. Okay. The uh, centripetal force needs to be provided by a real-life force in that situation. Okay? And the only force that's going to provide that is the friction between the tyres and the road itself. Okay? So we need the force of friction between the tyres and the road that's pointing towards the centre, so that is definitely, in this case, A. Question 32. Okay, so question 32 is a moments question, okay? So they tell us it's a uniform balanced beam. So a balanced beam means the sum of the clockwise and the sum of the anti-clockwise moments must be equal. So we've got a few things we need here. We need the equation for a moment, which is moment equals force times perpendicular distance to the pivot. And we need this idea that our total uh, anti-clockwise equals our total clockwise moments. Sorry, my arrows aren't drawn very well on the iPad. Okay, so let's think about which forces are turning it clockwise and which forces are going anti-clockwise. So we can see this 3 Newton force is turning it anti-clockwise. This 4 Newton force is turning it clockwise. And this force P is also turning it clockwise. Okay, so let's put that all into one big equation. So all the anti-clockwise moments, I've got force 3 times its distance 6. I'm just going to leave all the distances in centimetres because those units will cancel out later on. Okay, so I've got 3 times 6. I've got a clockwise moment from the 4 Newton force, so that's 4 times two centimetres to the pivot and also on this side I'm going to have the moment from P which is P whoops doesn't want to draw that doesn't want to draw that either times two centimetres okay so then just expanding this out and rearranging it I've got 18 equals 8 plus 2P okay P equals 5. Okay, so P is going to be A, 5 newtons. Question number 33. Okay, this one we don't really have any equations for, we just got to have a little bit of a, a think about this one. Okay, so we've got four shapes cut from the same piece of card. Okay, so card's pretty uniform, its mass doesn't change depending on where you are in the card. Okay, so the centre of mass nearest the bottom will be the piece of card that has the most of it near the bottom. Okay, So just having a look at that, compared to the rest of them, most of its mass is near the bottom in C. A, we've got lots of mass near the top and lots of mass near the bottom. Okay, B is a circle, so again it's evenly distributed between the top and the bottom. But in C, we've definitely got more mass at the bottom than we have at the top. So its centre of mass will be lower than the others, so the answer will be C. Okay, question number 34. So in question 34, we're looking at Hooke's law. And Hooke's law is the force, the force F is proportional to the extension, or F equals KX. Okay, so they've given us an example that when a force of 2 newtons is added, we get an extension of 4 millimetres. Then they've told us we have a length of wire um, when there's a further force added, what will the new extension be? Okay, so we can put in our numbers at the start, which is 2 newtons produces an extension of 4 millimetres. I'm just going to leave it in millimetres to keep it nice and simple here. Okay, so that means my constant here, or my um, constant of proportionality from my Hooke's law, K, is going to be equal to 
2 divided by 4, or 0 0.5 newtons per millimeter. Okay, so that means every 0 0.5 newtons, okay, my wire stretches by one millimeter. Okay, so then taking that back to our new one, we've got a further three newtons. So in total, that's five newtons of force. Okay, and I want to find the extension. So I'm going to rearrange that equation. I'm going to put it up on the top here. X equals, okay, F divided by K. My new F is five. My K we found earlier was 0 0.5. So that is an extension of 10 millimeters. Okay, that's an extension of 10 millimeters. It had an initial length of 1,000 millimeters. So in total, I've got a new length of 1,100, 1,010 millimeters. C. Okay, question number 35. Question number 35 is a density question. Okay, and the equation for density, you should remember, is P equals uh, the density equals the mass divided by the volume. Okay, so we've got the mass of each paper clip and its density. And we've got a total volume of paper clips. We want to know how many paper clips are there. So we've got the total volume of paper clips. So if we know how large each paper clip is, we know how many paper clips we need to make that volume. Okay, so one paper clip's volume, rearranging this equation, V equals mass divided by density. Okay, so the volume of one paper clip is going to be equal to 0 0.5 divided by 8, okay, which is 0 0.0625. Okay. My total volume is 20. If each one has that volume, okay, how many do I have? So I've got 20 centimetres cubed in total. Each one is 0 0.0625. So I divide 20 by that to find out how many I would need to make it. And 20 divided by that equals 320. Okay. So there must be 320 paper clips, D. Okay, question number six. So a coal-fired uh, coal power station uh, has a turbine and a generator. What are the output forms of energy? Well, our coal-fired power station, what happens is we have a boiler with the uh, coal, which heats up water, which evaporates to steam. The steam turns the turbine, the turbine powers the generator, and the generator sends out electrical energy, which we then use in our national grid. So what we have is we have steam being pushed along. And my pencil decides to start working, here we go. So steam gets pushed along, and it gets to a turbine. Okay, a turbine is like a propeller, which has a, um, a metal shaft attached to it, which then goes into my generator, I'm going to call G here, call T my turbine, and then out of my generator, got some wires, and a little bulb here to show you that they're going to go and probably power people's houses turning on their lights. So as this steam comes in, what's going to happen is it's going to turn this turbine here. So it's going to make the turbine move. And the turbine's going to then make this shaft move to power my generator. So if it's a moving motion, that means my turbine is still kinetic energy. It's going from kinetic energy from steam to kinetic energy in the turbine. It's not actually changing the form of energy there. The turbine powers the generator, but we know a generator turns kinetic into electrical. So my turbine is kinetic output, my generator sends out electrical, so that only option there is D. Okay, question 37. A man lifts 20 bricks, each weighs 6 newtons. What other information is needed to calculate the useful work done? Okay, so key bit here is work done. And we know the equation for work done equals force times distance. We've got the force, which is the weight. We don't know the distance. Okay, so then really simple must be 
A, because we can't find work done until we know the distance he lifts the bricks. Okay, 38 is our um, refraction question, so this one's about the critical angle. Okay, so this is just your knowledge. You should know the critical angle is the angle of incidence at which the refracted ray travels along the surface or the boundary line. Okay, so we've got here a refracted ray travelling along the boundary line. The angle of incidence is the angle between the normal and the ray that came in. So that is my angle I there. So the angle at which that has happened, it's definitely B in this case. 39. What device uses ultraviolet radiation? Well, UV has a number of uses. Okay, so one thing we can think about is UV. When you go outside, you normally wear UV protection sunglasses or UV protection um, uh, sun lotion. Okay, sometimes we use UV for things like paint or for checking banknotes. Okay, there's a few options there. Electric grill, probably not. Intruder alarm, probably not. Remote controller, probably not. Sunbed, ooh, we just talked about the fact that we use sun lotion and UV glasses to protect us from UV because they cause damage to the, um, the uh, cells in your skin, which in turn causes you to tan. Okay, so this one's definitely D, the sunbed. Okay, so question number 40 now. Okay, this is a static question, so kind of a throwback from year nine. We've got a positively charged metal sphere. Okay, it uh, comes close to but does not charge an uncharged metal sphere. So the thing I know here is, in total, this sphere must be positively charged. It must have more positive than negative charge. An uncharged sphere must, in total, have a neutral charge. Okay, it must, in total, have a neutral charge. In a metal sphere, metals have free-moving electrons. Okay, electrons are free to move in metal. Electrons are our negative charges. So we know the negative charges are free to move. If I bring a positively charged sphere near a uncharged sphere, I know the negative charges in it will be attracted. So negative charges in my uncharged sphere will move towards the positively charged sphere. Okay, so then I've got, which cases are that the case? I've got B and D. But we just mentioned earlier our uncharged sphere must have a total charge of zero. In B, I've now got a negatively charged sphere. But in D, I've got the same number of positive and negative charges. The answer is D here. When those negative charges have moved across, okay, they have left the right-hand side of that sphere. So the right-hand side of that sphere has lost negative charge and has been left positive. Okay, so the answer is Thank you.